when I was a little kid, I loved to play with blocks. And I remember the pleasure of discovering that two of the square blocks were the same size as one rectangular block, and that two rectangular blocks were the same size as one big block. And this is all pre-kindergarten, but that was the moment when I believe I was learning arithmetic, when I was learning that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and maybe even that 2 times 2 equals 4. Now, I would never argue that at, age f that at the point at which I did that, you could have given, put me, sat me down with a piece of paper and said, were the words 2 plus 2 equals x, and had me fill that out. I couldn't. But I was building up the mental model of numerical relationships that I would then learn formally in school later. But the critical thing was I got there by playing. There's a value to writing 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's shorthand. It's a good symbol system. But it's not how we actually think about numbers. You don't need, same, same thing with words on paper. Words on paper are really valuable. Reading is really great. What do we do when we read? We think about ideas. So the last thing you need to do in a game is just give people the same symbol system that they use in school. Give them interesting ways of thinking about stuff. It, it is part of our nature to play and it is part of our nature to rise to challenges when presented to us if those challenges are interesting. They don't have to be uh, meaningful in the way that um, uh, f religion or philosophy is meaningful. But, they, but they're challenging and they're interesting. And so we, we rise to those challenges. And that means that we as designers, if we put interesting challenges in front of people, I'd argue we can get them to think about things and do things that they might not otherwise have an opportunity to think about or do. I like to characterize it in terms of four freedoms. First, the ex freedom to experiment, the blocks. I was Clearly, no one said, this is what you do with blocks. You build these structures. Um, you see a lot of play nowadays where that happens, where you, get, you buy the Lego Star Wars uh, TIE fighter, and all you can build is a TIE fighter, as opposed to an open box of Le Lego where you can build anything you want. Well, anyway, so I had the freedom to experiment. Um, related to that is the freedom to fail. When you, build st when you play with stuff, things don't always work. That's got to be part of the game. Imagine a kid building a block tower with a parent standing behind him saying, OK, that's a nice tower, but whatever you do, don't let that tower fall down. Think about how, cons how uncomfortable that play would become if the child was worried about failing. Or we can build a, we can build a sand castle at the beach, but don't build it close enough to the water because it might get washed away. I mean, that's part of the fun, right? Failure is part of the game, part of play. Freedom to try and identities. Uh, think about your own play when, you're play when you were little, when you were young, and you played with dolls or stuffed animals, and you were acting out all the different people you knew and the, the kinds of roles you, you encounter in life. Parents, children, authority figures, uh, bullies. You played out all those different roles when you were a kid. You're trying them all on. You're trying to see what it feels like to be all the different things you might be in life. That's a critical part of play. Finally, freedom of effort. It's really important when you're playing that no one tells you you've got to play hard right now. In fact, when you're playing, sometimes you play hard, sometimes you play in a relaxed way. That's entirely up to the player. The minute someone says, OK, get going, get to work, it stops being play. So those are all critical. And, and it's critical because I, the reason I mention this is because when you start thinking about games, it's easy to forget all that fact. The, the four freedoms of play are really the four freedoms of learning. Of learning is about experimenting. It's about freedom to fail. It's about thinking about yourself in different roles. And learning is sort of self-directed and effort, you know, your effort is going to change. But compare that to school for a minute. Um, I know I'm being a little subversive here, but stay with me. Um, how often are you allowed to fail in school? How, how often are you ever encouraged to, uh, to make use of your failures in school? Or to even learn from your failures? And certainly, and experimenting in school, usually, uh, how many science labs actually ask you to really experiment? I mean, most science labs, you sit there and you do the list in the order that is, and, you, and if you don't get the result that you think the teacher wanted, maybe you fake it, maybe. Because the idea that you could learn from the failed experiment, you know. And forget about identities, right? You know, even though you're not, you're not allowed to come in one day and say, I feel like being this person. And you're certainly not allowed to, there's certainly no allowance for the fact that one day you feel like working hard and the next day you don't. I don't want you to think about how can I replicate school in a game. 
not that there aren't lots of really good things in school, but I think school the way you experience it on a day-to-day -day basis is not what you want to replicate in a game. There's lots of things out there called learning games. Um, but I would argue that most of them aren't playful, and therefore most of them aren't learning. I said, what's your name? He said, Martin. I turn around like this, and I notice that he's erasing his tiger. And I leapt over the room, and I said, no. And I said, what, why, why are you erasing it? And he said, oh, it's so, supposed to be a tiger, but it doesn't look like one. And I said, it's tigerish. And he looked at me with a big smile on his face. He's like, tigerish? And I'm like, yeah, it's your, it's your version of a tiger. I said, martinish. It's a martinish, tigerish. And he, so he's laughing, and then he starts fixing up the, the line that he was erasing. Meanwhile, all the kids came around, and sh they noticed that I was excited about this tigerish. So they're showing me their drawings. They're like monkey-ish, snake-ish, uh, lion-ish. And I'm like, that worked. I'm going to write that down. So I wrote down the word ish. I stuck it in my pocket. And then I said, Do you know what? I'm going to start using it more often. So I was using a couple of weeks later. And there was a class of kids where we were doing ish art. And it was all good, right? Every, any drawing, everything that any kind of mark anybody made it was, it was an ish drawing. A little girl comes up to me, and she's she has this little crumpled sheet of paper, and she looks this way and that way, and she says, I'm not sure if it's a poem, but it's poem-ish. And I thought, how cool is that? Because she took the ish concept, and she brought it over to, to writing. And she wasn't sure. Like, maybe she would never have shown that poem to somebody. But because it was poem-ish, she was able to. So one of my missions as a, a storyteller um, and a media maker is to get people to be more brave and to think for themselves. Because if you don't do your own thinking, somebody else will. And we have a wonderful world here with a conveyor belt. And we will take you along. And you don't have to say a word. You don't have to make anything. We will take you along and it stops eventually, and you'll have missed out. Or you can have a thinking journey, right? I especially love when people, when I hear people say, I can't, or it's not possible, right? It's like, oh, it just, you know, we tried that, it doesn't work. It's like, well, maybe we didn't try it like this, and you try it in a brand new way. You can turn it upside down. When you've got a dream and you want to get something done, or you want some, to achieve something, uh, the more that you can share it, the more that you can tell other people, amazing things start to happen because there are, it's a wonderful world out there actually and there are a lot of people that want to help you. Write about your dream, draw your dream, animate your dream, make it move, share it with the world and then see who comes knocking. It may only be one person, but that one person might change your life. Get in there, let the world know who you are and what you're thinking and what you believe in. Make it a, a, a better world.